All right, welcome back. We are discussing the economy right about now. We're looking at um, the year 2022 in retrospect and appraisal of how the economy fed uh, in the year 2022. Looking at the macro uh, economic fundamentals, uh, inflation, GDP growth, uh, uh, monetary policies, reforms uh, within the economy. We're looking at power and all of that. How did we fare? in the year 2022. Yes, we're being joined by uh, Muda Yusuf, who is the Director of Center for the Promotion of a Private Enterprise. He's joining us virtually this beautiful uh, uh, morning. Good morning, uh, uh, Muda Yusuf. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Compliments of the season to you. Yes, I, I was going to take that from you, but you took it from me. Uh, Comment of the season to you too, uh, to Muda Yusuf. Yes, the year is winding down. We're just about um, three three days to the end of 2022 so it is not going to be going to, it's not going to be out of place if we begin to appraise how the economy uh, fared in the year in, in this year 2022 uh, there's a figure that hit the airwaves this morning about 166 million naira was spent only on movie movie watchers within this christmas season these are significant fundamentals that could also uh, that change the trajectory of our expectations for uh the year 2022 but then let's let's begin from january and let's look at how the year had fed um looking at inflation figures uh that benchmark 15 about 15 percent uh by january as we speak is about 21.7 percent we've seen uh, a rise uh, in the inflation figures and by, by extension, by implication, uh, increase in, in prices of foods and commodities. We've seen uh, uh, value of our currency uh, being lost given to these uh, inflationary pressures that the economy, economy has been faced with. Muda, where did we get it wrong in our, in, in our attempt to curb inflation in the year 2022? Where did we get it wrong? Yeah, <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, before I address the issue of inflation, I think it would be ideal to look at the totality of the economy from the point of view of the output in the economy. I'm talking here now about the GDP growth because the GDP encompasses the totality of economic activities in the economy. Uh, in Q1, we had a GDP growth of 3.11%. In Q2, we had a GDP growth of 3.54%. Then we experienced a deceleration in Q3 to 2.25%. Now, if you look at the context in which the economy had operated or had functioned this year. Uh, it's one of the most challenging, both for citizens and for investors. There are quite a number of headwinds. So to still remain in a positive trajectory, as far as growth is concerned, I think is something that uh, we need to appreciate as a people and also as an economy. Uh, it's a demonstration of some so some degree of resilience on the part of citizens and on the part of businesses, particularly the small businesses, the informal sector. So I think we need to put that in perspective. Now, coming back to the issue of inflation. Uh, inflation is one of the biggest challenges or the biggest problems that we faced in 2022. It has never been this bad. And you can see the implication of that for poverty. The World Bank reported that as a consequence of the surging inflation, we, over 5 million people dropped into poverty. And if you ask me, I think it will even be more than that in reality. Because the latest figure we have about the number of people in poverty is 133 million people. And I can tell you that the inflationary pressure played a major role in driving so many people into poverty because of the impact it has on purchasing power, on real incomes. 
Yes, inflation figure, the last figure we had, I think for November was 21.47% uh, or thereabout. But the reality is that if you look at prices from January to date, and you look at the prices or the basket of goods that people consume, the reality of inflation is that it's far more than 21%. Because in some cases, prices have doubled. So you should be looking at inflation in reality of between 50 to 100 percent. Look at the price of rice, look at the price of cooking gas, look at the price of tomato, uh, beans, uh, gari. I mean, all the basic things that people consume. So it has been, it has been very, very devastating. And the issue is that first, we have what you can call domestic factors. You have global factors. Global factors, of course, we don't have much control over that. We have things like the uh, Russia and Ukraine war. We knew the impact of that on energy costs and all of that. Even though we should be benefiting from that in a way because we are not a producing country. But unfortunately, we also be we became a victim. A victim just like all these uh, oil important economies. That is one. Of course, we see how the lingering effects of the pandemic. Uh, of course, we are get, gradually getting out of it, but it, there are still some effects. As we speak, China, with whom we also trade a lot with, they are still grappling with the problem of COVID. So there are still lingering effects of the disruption in supply chains globally. Then domestically, I think one of the key issues has to do with the energy cost. I mean, you see what the cost of uh, diesel has been. And because of the challenges with uh, our public power supply, a lot of operators in the economy still depend on diesel. The price of diesel went up as high as uh, 800 naira per liter. In some cases, 850. And that is impacting first the cost of production because a lot of people still rely on diesel or generator for their for their energy needs. It's also impacted seriously on the cost of transportation because most of these uh, big buses that you know, move people around, all these trucks that move uh, commodities, that move raw materials, that move this, all, all of these vehicles are, are powered by diesel. So there's a pass through effect to the cost of transportation and to the general price level. Then we have the challenge of foreign exchange, which also had a profound impact on inflation. Even though we have seen some, you know, fair stability in the in the official window, but the reality is that we have expressed massive depreciation in our exchange rate. Now we are talking about uh, 750. 770, that was the time it was getting to 800, almost crossing 800. So the foreign exchange situation has been extremely bad from the point of view of the depreciation of the currency, from the point of view of uh, the volatility, the unpredictability, and above all, the scarcity of foreign exchange. It has led to very embarrassing situations for our country. Many investors' funds were trapped. Airlines could not repatriate their, their revenues from ticket sales and so, and so on and so forth. It's one of the most embarrassing things that have happened to us as a country. Then, of course, we have challenges of insecurity, which also contributed to the food component of inflation. Many of our people are in IDP camps. Most of them are farmers. They can't go to farms and all of that. So that also took a toll. Then at the close of the year, maybe two, a month or two months ago, we had serious issues with climate change, flooding, which ravaged many farming communities. Many of our food crops were, were destroyed. Many communities were actually shut down completely. Mobility became a problem. There was no connectivity, there was no transportation. Some, some, some states were practically on total lockdown or shutdown because of the flooding. So that also contributed. Then you have other components of climate change like desertification. 
it has been creating a whole lot of problems, including the problem of insecurity in the northern parts of the country. A lot of arable lands have been lost to desertification, which has also been leading to clashes between herders and farmers, because you know there's a scramble for the few available uh, arable land and, and plants. So these are these are some of the issues. Then there is the monetary component of inflation, which is another area where we probably also got it wrong. The CBI financing of deficits has been extremely high. Right now, it's co currently, cumulatively, it's over 20 trillion. And when you pump that kind of money, which we call high-powered money in economies into an economy, it's, 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 it's great what you call high-powered po high money. It's worth inflation significantly. Right. So there's also this monetary Call component of, uh, of inflation and the impact on liquidity. So these are a whole lot of issues that have caused it. So if you have to roll it back, you should, you should be looking at these causes. Because you want to solve a problem, you look at the causative factors. So these are the factors that have contributed to it. So if you want to you know, curb inflation, these are the things that uh, we should be looking at. Well, while many were looking at the 2022 elect, uh, cycle as possibly a year of optimism, considering the dramatic turn of events from 2020 when the COVID lockdown came about and 2021 and the protest and all of the issues that also came about, many would have been saying 2022 would be a bounce back year. Was there much of a bounce back in terms of Nigeria's economy? And um, how much more do we need to do to begin to rejuvenate ourselves from where we currently are to where we want to be? Well, uh, when we compare the performance to the year of the pandemic, which was 2020, there was a partial bounce back. I just told you that we recorded a GDP growth of uh, 2.25% in the third quarter of this year. We haven't got the result for the fourth quarter. I mean, when you compare that to the contraction that we had in 2020, it's an improvement. I mean, it shows that it shows some level of recovery. We knew that at a point, quite a number of uh, sectors were completely on lockdown. There was restriction on movements domestically. And globally, all of those things have been relaxed now. So the tempo of economic activities have picked up. But what we didn't get right was our own domestic policies. Those, those were the issues. For instance, our foreign exchange policy was a major problem for the domestic economy. It created a whole lot of distortions. We have this multiple exchange rates. We have this administration, administrative allocation of foreign exchange, which created a whole lot of corruption, patronage, and all of that, which also created a paradise for, for, for currency brokers. That is one of the worst policy issues that we had in 2022. So we didn't manage our foreign exchange environment, right? We saw a very big gap, unprecedented premium between the official rates and, and the parallel market rates, close to 90%. So people who are round tripping are making more money than those who are entrepreneurs or those who are manufacturers. And that has now became that now became a big enterprise on its own, flourishing better than even the legitimate uh, economic activities. So we didn't get it right with our foreign exchange environment. Then at the management of our oil and gas sector, we also have not performed well at all. In almost eight years of this administration, we couldn't fix the refineries. I mean, that, that is also a major embarrassment. That as an oil producing country, we are spending close to $15 billion annually to be importing petroleum products. It's very embarrassing. I mean, how do we explain that? 
And you can see the impact of this massive importation of petroleum products on the fiscal operations of government. You can see the impact on our reserves. You can see the impact on our exchange rates. Because we are spending so much, there is a problem of subsidy, there is a problem of outflows, there are a problem of even investment because of the policy environment. When you are having you have a system where you are fixing price, you are so much subsidy. We have a monopoly situation in, uh, in, in, the, in the oil and gas space. Right now, NMPC is practically the only supplier of petroleum products. How can an economy function properly in that kind of environment? You know? So the management of our you know, oil and gas sector has been a major setback for us as a country. Then, of course, our insecurity, we didn't, I'm not sure we got it well properly. And related to the oil and gas is all the problem of deficits that we have incurred and the impact of that on the macroeconomic environment. I mean, when you have a deficit that is getting close to almost 10 trillion, the implication of that on your debt, on your debt profile, the implication of that on debt servicing, and we got to a point where almost 100% of revenue, actual revenue, was spent to, to service debt. That is, that, is, that is the point we are at this moment. That means that all the critical expenditures of government, whether it is recurrent or capital, is being funded almost 100% by borrowing. And this is a vicious cycle. If we don't break that cycle, We'll be getting deeper into debt. Only recently, the, the president sent another supplementary budget of over 800 billion, you know, which will have to be funded entirely by borrowing. So these are some of the fiscal challenges that have been created because we didn't manage some areas very well. We didn't manage our foreign exchange environment well, therefore, we are not having investment. We didn't manage our oil and gas sector well. Therefore, we are spending so much to import petroleum products. We are not able to earn enough from, uh, from uh, foreign exchange. We are not able to take advantage of the higher oil price. All of these are domestic economic management issues. These are not global problems. These are self-inflicted. Yeah. Then you have the problem of oil theft. Yes. I mean, how do you explain a situation well, we have a government in place, we have security agencies in place, and for so many years, people were loading in tankers, stolen crude oil from our territory. It's only recently that government just woke up to it and, you know, trying to fix it. So what happened all these years? All of these things are, are governance issues. Mm. So these are, these are some of the gaps that has led us to all of these areas. Yes, uh, 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 Dr. Muda Yusuf, all of these gaps that you've highlighted, uh, by, the time I want, by the time I put them side by side with the growth that uh, the figures claim that have been recorded in the first, second, and third quarter, I begin to wonder how this translates to uh, wealth and better life for the Nigerian people. Obviously, it does not translate to any of that. I am afraid we're waiting for the next uh, uh, inflation figures that would come out, and then I, I'm afraid what the figures would be like, given to the fact that uh, the last quarter uh, had been had been bedeviled by fuel scarcity. Yes, fuel scarcity uh, increasing the prices of um, goods and services, uh, increasing transportation. So no doubt, no doubt, the figures uh, for 20 uh, Q4. 2022 would obviously be one that we would not be excited about when we get that figure. However, going into the year 2023, if we must curb and address all of uh, uh, the gaps that have been highlighted so far from the year 2022, uh, what sort of reforms would you be expecting uh, within the economy in terms of what, 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 what reforms are you looking forward to? if we must um, get out of this uh, quadmire 
a dull drum that we find ourselves as, uh, as a people. Well, uh, first of all, we need to get our political transition right. Because if we did not manage the political transition very well, that could create a whole lot of crisis. And when you have a crisis as a result of poor outcomes of the democratic process or electoral process, there's no way the economy can function. So it is important that the key agencies, key institutions of state that are going to manage or that are managing the electoral process do their job with utmost highest level of credibility and integrity and transparency. So I'm talking of INEC, I'm talking of the judiciary, I'm talking of the security agencies. We should be able to deliver a credible election that will not leave us with another crisis. Having said that, there are key reforms which we have been talking about over these years that needs to happen. First, we need to reform the foreign exchange market. The current foreign exchange policy is highly dysfunctional and it has created a major problem for investors, whether domestic or foreign. So we need to fix the foreign exchange environment, make it more predictable, make it more transparent, such that it can inspire the confidence of investors. Right now, we are not getting inflows of investors, either portfolio investors or FDI, because of the experience of existing investors in the economy. Because if you have a situation where your foreign investors funds are trapped, where they cannot repatriate their profit, they can't repatriate dividend, aircraft cannot repatriate uh, their ticket funds, then you have sent a terrible signal to investors around the world. And all of these things are consequences of this functional foreign exchange policy. So the first thing to do is to reform the foreign exchange environment. And that should not take time. Within a month or two, you we can do that. Secondly, we need to reform our oil and gas sector. Yes, some steps have been taken already through the Petroleum Industry Act, but we, are, we have not been as bullish as we should be. We didn't address the issue of reforming the sector with the kind of urgency that it demands. And all of these things are happening because a lot of people are benefiting from the status quo. People are smiling to the bank because of the poor governance of the oil and gas sector. So we need to commit a lot more in 2023 to reforming the oil and gas sector, both downstream and upstream. In the upstream, we have lost vital investors. All the multinationals that are in the upstream, multinational oil companies, they have, most of them have divested. So we need to restore confidence in that, in that, in, in the oil and gas sector, upstream. And that will require first addressing the problem of insecurity in the oil and gas space in the Niger Delta, and also ensuring that we have the right kind of policies that will encourage investment, new investors, and that will also support existing investors, both indigenous and foreign, that are currently in the upstream sector of the oil and gas. Because we are losing a lot by failure to manage, to govern that space properly. You can see many of the oil producing countries, they are smiling at this time. They are making a kill. Their foreign reserves are overflowing. Their currency is getting stronger. That is what should be happening to us if you have managed our oil and gas sector properly. Then on the downstream, we need to ensure that we move quickly to reform the downstream, particularly by ensuring that we, re we deregulate the sector. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. let me appeal to labor at this point. We should appeal to the Labour Congress. They should please allow the government, the incoming government, to liberalize, to reform the oil and gas sector downstream, to remove this subsidy and clean up the downstream sector so that you can have more investment, you can have sanity. All this recalling fuel queues, corruption with subsidy, equalization fund, all this 
complete this systemic breakdown in the sector, I think we need to get it right. Then yeah. we also need to deal with reforming the budget process. There's a lot of issues with the structure of the budget. There's too much focus and uh, spending on recurrence. There's transparency issues, budget padding. All of these issues around the budgetary process and getting our priorities right with budget. So these are some of the reforms that need to take place if you must properly restrict this economy in 2023. Right. Of course, the World Bank had warned uh, on what you just touched on, the, the, the slow growth in Nigeria's oil production at 3.1 percent, definitely not good enough. And the major reason why they are concerned is that the population growth in Nigeria is at 2.6 percent, meaning that there are more mouths to feed from the little oil that we are generating. How critical is that? And how critical is it then for the government coming into office next year to find solutions uh, to the oil and gas sector and diversification away from the oil and gas sector? No, that, that is very critical, no doubt. Uh, of course, the economy is not growing at the rate at which the population is growing. But more importantly, when we talk about the welfare and the well-being of the people, we should be looking at indicators like the Human Development Index. Because sometimes you can be having growth and you are not having development. You can be having growth and your people are getting poorer. We have had that experience in the past. So we need to take these metrics or these variables together. Nigeria is the highest, is the biggest economy on the continent. We have a GDP of close to 500 billion US dollars. But when it comes to Human Development Index, we are number 132 in Africa. So you can see the disconnect between GDP and the welfare of the people. And if you look at the SD, SDG goals, that's sustainable development goals. Our performance is one of the lowest in Africa. So there should be greater focus on welfare, on economic inclusion, on issues that relate to poverty, human capital development and all of that. Those things are key. And to get to your point about how we can, you know, make the economy better, diversify the economy, some of the issues that need to happen are those things that I've just said. We need to, you know, undertake some critical reforms that will allow more investment to come into the economy. You cannot grow an economy if there is no investment. And there cannot be investment if your policies are not right. If your regulatory environment is hostile. If your monetary policy is, is not right. If your foreign exchange policy is dysfunctional. If your, if your institutions are also corrupt. You can't have investment. And, and so, so it is investment that can transform an economy. Uh, and so maybe, maybe, so may, maybe many are then concerned about the new policies put in place by the Central Bank of Nigeria and the confidence it might have on potential investors in the country. Well, Central Bank of Nigeria, I think, is also one of the major problems we have in the economy because of its policies. You know, I, I've talked a lot about the foreign exchange policy. Is the baby of the Central Bank of Nigeria. That is at the heart of getting this economy to be back on its feet. Then we have all these peripheral policies, uh, the designing of uh, currency, uh, withdrawal limits. You know, this, 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 these are not issues. This, these are non-issues. There are more important things for the Central Bank to be doing. You don't fix what is not broken. Cash as a percentage of GDP in Nigeria is one of the lowest in the world. Cash as a percentage of GDP is 1.8 percent. That's a major measure of cash dominance in an economy. 
cash as a percentage of money supply is just about 6%. So we don't have problem with the issue of excessive cash at all. Transactions in an electronic platform is over 200 trillion. Transactions in a, a POS platform is over 6 trillion. Transaction in mobile money is also over six trillion. So what is the problem? You don't fix what is not broken. That is the least of our problem as a country. I mean, we, we were recently downgraded by Fitch. We have earlier been downgraded by Moody's on account of our fiscal environment, on account of our external position, on, on account of all the management of the key uh, policy policy issues in the economy. Those are more important things for the CDN to be doing. If you want to change votes by uh, kidnappers, that is not the function of the central bank. You have institutions of states whose responsibilities are that. So for me, those are complete distractions. We have important things to do to ensure that we have the right monetary policy. Now our cash reserve ratio is 32.5%. It's one of the highest you can have anywhere in the world. And what that means is that for every 100 million Naira deposits, 32.5 million is going to be sterilized with the central bank. So how do you want the bank to function, uh, to play their role as, uh, as financial intermediaries? Because financial intermediation is the principal role of the banking system. Then you have uh, your NPR at 16.5. And yet, these things are not addressing the problem of inflation. And it's creating a whole lot of problem for those who are, who are borrowing money from the bank because it's shooting up interest rates. So these are some of the problems that we need to, we need to fix in the monetary policy area. Because the, the, the management of our monetary policy environment is part of the problems that we have in the economy. Rather than solve the problem, it seems to be adding more to the problem that we have. So we need to, we need, we need to revisit some of the critical policy uh, components of some of the critical policy measures of, of, of the Central Bank of Nigeria, especially around this monetary policy tightening around foreign exchange, around interest rate management, there's a whole lot of work that needs to be done in that space. You, you know, uh, uh, Muda, in as much as we, we agree uh, that there is still so much uh, uh, to be done within the monetary policy space, uh, we should also not forget the fact that um, there is a need for uh, an alignment uh, between uh, fiscal and monetary policy uh, because what we have seen in recent times is a, a disalignment between uh, fiscal and monetary policy authorities uh, moving in different directions and, and counter uh, counter productivities here and there. Uh, before we let you go, Dr. Muda, uh, government is proposing an increase in salaries for 2023. I did not see that captured in the, in the budget for 2022. How do you think uh, this will play out? Uh, for next year, a possible increase in salaries uh, for 2023. Uh, are you there? I think we we lost signal there with uh, uh, Isuf. We're yeah. hoping that we can get him. Uh, to respond. Fantastic Very quickly conversation. Before we wrap up with the conversation yeah. with them, because yeah, there's quite a lot for us to, 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 to take from all he has said this morning. And of course, Nigerians must be looking forward to what the leaders who are coming into office uh, April, forward, May, yeah. they're about yeah. have that will be different from what we've had in the past couple of years under President Mahmoud Buhari, yeah. and of course under the <clears throat> Central Bank of Nigeria, and other drivers of the Nigerian economy, especially in the oil and gas industry, uh, of course those who control the finances of the nation, and how budgets are being drawn, mm. and of course how such budgets are implemented 
uh, nationally and even locally. These are the critical issues that Nigeria faces yeah. as time progresses. Yeah. We are having year on year borrowings, borrowings, borrowings. But are the borrowings proportionate to development? Many, questions, many Nigerians will probably say no. If the borrowings are not proportionate to what they can see on yeah. ground or, yeah. the, or the monies that can be received. Say, for example, there were uh, close to 100 million people um, heading into poverty when President Buhari was coming into office. And right now, we are now over that 100 million benchmark. Mm. And so much money had been expanded into mm. all kinds of implementation plans, all kinds of intervention funds, mm. all kinds of uh, programs mm. that were put in place by the federal government. Yet, more than 100 million people as of today are mm. in poverty. You're having trillions, David. I'm sure mm. if each person got a million naira from such intervention programs, Definitely, we would not have expo ex exhausted a trillion naira out of 200 million people. So where are all the Sincerity borrowings? Sincerity of purpose, <laughs> transparency uh, by government officials, uh, these are major concerns around, um, uh, around the economy going, for, going forward. Transparency and sincerity of purpose. These are key conversations we cannot stop having if we must get uh, this economy to where, where it should be. Uh, Muda has highlighted, I mean, brought to the fore all of the concerns around an oil theft, uh, policy implementation, uh, foreign, I mean, uh, foreign exchange management and all of that. So if we can get all of this right, if we can get all of this right, you talked about the fact that uh, 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 we were borrowing, but then we are not seeing the, the impact of the borrowings. Uh, I put it to you, Wilson, when you look at our revenue that we earned in 2022 and we look at uh, the recurrent expenditure, you begin to understand that even our, our revenues alone cannot even service our recurrent expenditure. So even when we borrow, we are borrowing to, uh, to service recurrent expenditure. Mm -hmm. We need to get to a place where the cost of governance has to come down. We've been having this conversation for as long as whoever can remember. We need to start having serious look at cost of governance. Salaries by a few percentage of Nigerians uh, within the legislative arm of government and all of that. Let's begin to look at cost of governance, cost of, of governance in Nigeria. Then we'll begin to understand that um, we are in a very uh, tight place in terms of revenue. If we can deal with that, maybe we don't need to borrow as much as we are borrowing. When mm. we borrow, we we'll probably would put it, uh, uh, you, know, you know, send those borrowings to uh, capital expenditure. That is when we can begin to see the dividends of, um, of the borrowings, when they are plowed into capital expenditure. And the more worrying, most worrying for me, David, is that um, I saw a report by one of those agencies that critically looks at Nigeria's spendings, and it has shown that we're having lawmakers, David, attribute their names to projects. Mm. Lawmakers are now putting their names on projects that were earmarked by the federal government. Mm. And one of the reasons why the budget was not passed as it was supposed to have been passed last week was because they said they needed to go and reconcile and tidy up some loose ends in the budget. Right. These loose ends, many are saying, are repeated yeah. are budgets. Their, are their, their interests. And interests. The, the loose ends are possibly their interests. And so these know. issues still remain in the budget that possibly some lawmakers or some members of, of the current government need to address need to tidy up so that there will be no issues when they it's present a, the budget to the public. It's a cross board. Even um, 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 agencies of government, you, you've, you've heard about when Department of, of course, Government... Of duplications. Come, duplications and uh, uh, they call it budget pardon and all of that. So it's a cross board. We, we need some... I keep using the word sincerity of purpose and transparency. Mm. When everybody wants this country to work, to get better, this country will get better. Well, a lot of people should begin should begin to shelve shelve their their personal interests. Uh, just maybe, I mean, printers are, are recurring uh, 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 items on on list of, of of agencies of government. Uh, computers are recurring items. Then you begin to wonder: Is it every year you buy printers? Every year you buy you buy fresh uh, uh, computers and all mm. of that. Uh, well. Uh, your guess is as good as mine. We we'll we have to anchor this conversation right about now. Absolutely, yeah. we have to go. Um, I'm sure that um, it's been a quite interesting conversation for our viewers this morning, and we have to see a big appreciation to all of those that joined us today uh, to make this.
program very rich, very interesting, and of course, very touchy on Nigerians as we continue to look forward into 2023 or cast in a retrospect into 2022 and all the year as portended for us. I remain Wilson Amoni. Remember that it's still time for you to go get your PVC. There is still time. Head to your respective INEC offices in your local governments, wherever you are situated or wherever you registered, to get your PVC ahead of the election. Beat the rush and be a part of the electoral process come 2023. And I'm David Babadike. Have a wonderful day and bye for now.